welcome to this holy hour of worship. We're so glad that you're here with us today. There are many things that are going on in the church and on the back of the bulletin it says you can go to our webpage and check out all of those wonderful events and hope you will come and join with us in that. And now as we begin to worship the Lord, let us together say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born under the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, we draw ourselves in to this holy space. We push all the worries and concerns of the world to the side so that we can be holy and completely in your presence. And in your presence, God, we are filled with such thanksgiving. We thank you that you are our God and that we are your people. We thank you that you loved us so much that you gave us your only son, Jesus Christ. We love you that in his life, his loving, his teachings, his death and his resurrection, he gave to us a promise, a promise of eternal life. And for that, we are so thankful. God, you are all glorious and all wonderful. And our hearts just melt before you. We seek to try to understand and we really can't conceive of how awesome you are. And so we come here today with our hearts open to you like a flower to the morning sun, just showing forth all that we have within us to praise and to honor you. Now, God, we pray for this world that we're living in. We know that you created a world that you wanted the lion and the lamb to lay down together, and it's anything but that. But we know that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can transform this world into the Eden that you truly created. And God, help us to do our part so that someday that beautiful kingdom will be right here on earth, just like it is in heaven. Now, God, we pray for all those that are in need, spiritually, physically, mentally. We know that there's many trials and tribulations in life, and though we don't know it, you know every single one. And so as your faithful children, we simply pray that your will be done and that you help us to align our wills with you. Now, God, bless this time together. Bless Amy as she breaks forth the word. Let it not just fall on our ears, but on our hearts too. And let that word transform us so that when we leave this place, we can truly be the hands and feet, heart and mind of Christ in this world. And now, God, we join together not only our hearts and minds, but our voices as we pray those beautiful words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Giving God, we recognize that you are the source of all goodness and life. In gratitude for your many blessings, we give you our tithes and offerings to you this day, knowing that all we have comes from you. Bless and use our gifts to help and continue the ministries you have called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, bought me Precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for the above. Seal it for thy courts above.
prophet Samuel. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy. He has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put on a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his own sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome. And he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give, you the, I'll give your flesh to the birds and the air and the beast of the fields. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of this Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know it is not by the sword or the spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we were about seven months pregnant with that girl over there when we first moved back to Alabama. It was the heat of an Alabama summer late in August, and we are moving back. My husband had just finished his Master of Divinity degree, and I was trudging my way through mine. One of our first tasks in getting settled at that point in our life, knowing that we were going to have her at any moment, was to go ahead and find a new church home. So I began to do what most people would do, and I did a deep dive on websites before we made our first visit. So based on the website alone, we found the church that would be the absolute perfect fit for what we thought our family's needs were at that time. We prepare ourselves, we work up the courage, we walk in the back doors of the sanctuary, we get there early, we make sure that we're trying to make eye contact with people as they arrive in the space, only to find that as people came into the space, they, were, they would look at us and see that we were actually looking at them and they would quickly look away and let their eyes shift. So by the time that the first hymn began, no one had spoken to us in that entire time. And so we looked at each other and we walked out of the back doors of the sanctuary. Throughout the next week, I began to look at more websites and do more digging and found this church that seemed to be completely not what we needed as a family. But we decided that we would go ahead and give it a try anyway. Showing up that next Sunday to another church, fearing the rejection, fearing an unwelcomed experience again was the last thing that we wanted to do, but yet we got ready and we showed up to that other church. Little did we know that that church that we showed up to that second time may have seemed like they didn't have anything that our family needed at that time, but instead would be the church where both of our babies would be born and baptized and the church that I would step into the first pulpit for myself of. 
This week I was listening to the radio and on the radio the broadcaster started talking about her experience of moving into a new community recently and trying to find her way and, and, and figure out how to do church in a new community in the midst of COVID. And she talks about how many times she pulled into the parking lot and then pulled back out. And how the last Sunday before she was speaking, she had pulled into the parking lot and she almost pulled back out of the parking lot, but worked up the courage to get out of the car and walk in the doors. And she talked about how as she walked in those doors, that was still the last thing that she wanted to do in that moment. But then she sat down and she said everything within her didn't want to show up that day. But it became clear through worship why it was important that she did show up. Because she said little did she know that there was a prayer that would speak to the depths of her soul in that moment. And little did she know that there was a message that was waiting for her to listen to. And little did she know that there was a song that would speak into the depths of her soul. Little did she know that the spirit would move in an amazing way because she was willing to show up. You know, I joked this morning about the irony that our topic today is why show up and we are in the midst of a winter weather advisory here in Tuscaloosa. We know excuses very well as to why we do not have to show up. Even before the pandemic, we were probably pros at times of why we did not need to show up on any given occasion. We could come up with any list of excuses, any list of reasons why it wasn't important whether or not we showed up. And then the pandemic only amplified the list of excuses that we could provide at any given moment as to why or why not it would make a difference if we showed up. Today especially is filled with any <coughs> list of excuses and yet here we are. But today is the day that we ask ourselves, what difference does it make if I show up? Why do I show up? What difference would it make if I didn't choose to show up? Thank you, Candace, for reading scripture just a few moments ago. It's a text that we most likely are at least semi-familiar with. Although as we prepared to shoot our promo video this week, I went through the Kitty College hallway and I pulled three kids and I said, okay, you know the story of David and Goliath, right? And they just kind of looked at me. And so we did a quick recap of the story of David and Goliath. And then I said, so can you be David for me? I was shot down twice before Tucker Ann rallied for us. So here's the scene. The Philistines were approaching from the coastal plain they were crossing the mountains and crossing the valleys and they were making their approach to take over the Israelites. At that time, the Israelites were led by this guy named King Saul. And King Saul heard that the Philistines were approaching and so he decided to go ahead and send his army. Well, at the point when the two armies met, they were on opposing mountaintops with a very large valley in between. And so there they stood gridlocked because neither side could advance on the other side because in order to do so, they would have to go all the way down their side of the mountain across the long valley and up the other side of the mountain. And in that amount of time, the other side could adequately prepare themselves to face the battle. And so they sat there on opposing mountaintops staring at each other, gridlocked. At that point in history, when this would happen, a common part of warfare would be to send forward one soldier from each side and let the two battle it out to death. And so that is what the Philistines did. But if I had Goliath on my side, I think I would do the same thing too. And so they sent forward Goliath, who when we convert that ancient measuring system into ours today could possibly be almost 10 feet tall. He carried with him armor that probably weighed, one piece of it weighed more than David himself. Goliath was not tall and lanky. Goliath was tall and fierce. And everything about Goliath was meant to intimidate his opponent. 
based on the statement that he was their champion, their prized fighter, I'm thinking that he was pretty successful in that. So our text tells us that not immediately, as soon as Goliath came down, did David step up to the fight, but for 40 days and for 40 nights, Goliath would come down the mountain into the valley and yell to the Israelites, taunting them, waiting for his opponent to rise up among the Israelites. Day after day and night after night, he would descend into the valley and he would call out to the Israelites, taunting them over and over and over again. And day after day, for 40 days and for 40 nights, the Israelites would sit there from the safety of their mountaintop as their giant taunted them. Everyone afraid to move. No one willing and courageous enough to step up to what would surely be a fight that they could not win. See, in every way of looking at this, Goliath could not be matched. He was far bigger than anyone the Israelites had to offer. He was far stronger. He was built for intimidation and fear. And he was also a championed soldier at that. No one in their right mind would go forward down into that valley and face Goliath when they knew that they could not match his strength and his stature. Throughout all of this time, though, there was this guy named David. And David would go to the front lines to deliver supplies to the soldiers. And as he would deliver the supplies to the soldiers, he would come back with a report that he would share with the community of what was happening from the front lines. And I'm guessing the report basically said, well, they're still sitting there staring at each other. Goliath's still coming down the mountain every day and yelling at them, but no one's stepping up and doing it. Don't know what's gonna happen here. Until that is, the 40 days and 40 nights had passed. And then David did what he had done all along and he prepared for someone to take care of his sheep so that he could go to the front lines. But only this time, instead of going to the front lines with supplies, he was going to the front lines to fight. And when he told King Saul what it was that he planned to do, King Saul tried to discourage him. And when that did not work, King Saul gave him his armor. Well, if you're going to go forward and you're going to do this, at least be protected. Here is my armor. See, David stepped forward in a fight that he knew that if he lost, not only would he lose his own life, but it would cost his family, his community, all that they had and their livelihood as well. He was so unmatched, and yet he was so willing to show up. As he went down the mountain, there was a river, and as he crossed it, he picked up five stones in the midst of that valley, and he pocketed four of the stones, and he got the fifth stone ready to go. He put it in his slingshot, and that one stone was all that it took. Last week, when we launched into this sermon series together, we talked about Caleb and his faith. And in the bridge, I talked about how Caleb's eyes were fixed on God, and that made all the difference. That for decades, his people were unwilling to do what seemed impossible because their eyes weren't fixed on God. Their eyes were fixed on the impossibilities of their situation. But Caleb's eyes were fixed on God, and therefore he saw the possibility when everyone else saw the impossibility. And that lesson applies to our time together today as well. Because here for 40 days and for 40 nights, the fiercest fighters of Israel only saw the impossibilities. Because their eyes were fixed on the size of that giant in front of them. Their eyes were fixed on how skilled and how large and how intimidating Goliath was. And so for 40 days and for 40 nights, they watched as that giant taunted them. But there was David. And one thing is clear from our scripture that David's eyes were fixed on God. David was relying on God's vision and God's strength. 
And David saw possibility when everyone around him saw all of the impossibilities. And in doing so, in focusing his eyes on God, he saw that he had a skill and an ability that could defeat Goliath. The very thing that King Saul gave him would be the thing that would make him lose his advantage that he had on Goliath. And so he approaches Goliath without any armor and so seemingly unmatched. As I think of this text, I can't help but to wonder how many of the Israelite soldiers had the same skill set that, that David did in that moment. I wonder how many of them also were trained with a slingshot and could have pulled it out and used a slingshot in the exact same way, but because their eyes weren't fixed on God, they never saw that as an option. I wonder how many of them, when they saw David pull out his slingshot and that one stone said, oh my goodness, I wish I would have thought about that. I could have done that too. But their eyes were so fixed on the giant and how big Goliath was that they were scared to show up because they didn't think that they could do it. You know, in our world today, we have so many reasons why we can very credibly not show up. We have excuse after excuse as to why it is not worth our time and effort to show up in the first place. I go back to that church and the many excuses and reasons why, that we had as to why we did not want to show up. But the thing about showing up is if we never show up, we'll just still be sitting there on the mountaintop, allowing the giant in front of us, all of the excuses of our lives to taunt us day in and day out, and nothing will change in our lives. Our faith will not grow. Whatever those giants are in our face will just continue to seem bigger and bigger and bigger until we focus our eyes on God and we show up. See, when we first visited that church, I had zero intention of ever stepping into a pulpit again in my life. I had made it clear to our superintendent that I was going into specialized ministry and that is where I would spend the rest of my time in ministry. Little did I know that that church that seemed to not be a fit for our family on paper would be the place that would welcome us, the place where both of our babies would be born and baptized, and the place that would encourage me to step into that pulpit. Honestly, when the superintendent called and said, hey, Amy, I have a church for you, I had every single intention within me to say no, and I did. It was only because we had already fallen in love with each other that I was willing to say yes and step into that pulpit. But none of that would have happened if we hadn't have shown up in the first place. If that first Sunday we would have defaulted into the list of excuses that we could have given to not show up, then perhaps I never would have stepped in to that pulpit. See, we ask ourselves, why does it matter if we show up? We say to ourselves, look, no one's going to notice if I show up or I don't anyway. It's not worth my time. It's not worth my energy. I could do all of these different things. But what if we change our focus? What if we change our perspective and allow our eyes to be fixed on God? What if instead of looking at all of the excuses that we have in life as to why we don't show up for whatever it is that we need to show up for, we keep our eyes fixed on God? Maybe then in the midst of all of that, we will see that if we don't show up, we are the ones missing out. Because we never know how the Spirit was planning to use us if we were willing to show up in the first place. So friends, what is it in our lives that we need to show up for right now? 
What's going on in the lives of the people around us that God is waiting to use us if we are willing to show up? Perhaps we are called in this moment to show up for a friend who we know is going through a rough time. And we've been avoiding it because we're scared that we'll say the wrong thing or we won't have enough of the right things to say. Perhaps we need to show up for a family in our community that's going through a rough time and we're scared to show up because we don't know where that will lead if we show up one time. Perhaps it is worship that we are called to show up to more frequently. And we shy away from that because we think that we can go unnoticed and we won't miss out because we have worship online and we can check it out later and there's endless resources online. But maybe we're the ones missing out when we don't show up. Or maybe it's small groups. Maybe we think that we don't need a small group anymore in our lives, that we have entered into a season where that's not necessary and our schedules just don't allow for it and we can come up with the millions of reasons why we don't make that a priority in our lives. But if we never show up, we're still just sitting there. As the Israelites sat there for 40 days and for 40 nights because no one would show up. My friends, God wants to use every single one of us, regardless. We can fill the rest of that with all of the excuses as to why we say no. We can say, well, I've already put in my time or my time is not yet here. We can say all of the things of I don't have enough time in my schedule for this. No one will notice anyway. Or maybe the greatest fear, someone actually will notice if I don't show up or I do show up. We can become our own biggest obstacle in showing up. But the fact of it all that I hope we learn from our scripture today is that I can't help but to picture those soldiers sitting there for 40 days and for 40 nights with a giant in the valley calling out and taunting to them and no one willing to step up until David, a seemingly unmatched young kid in their standards, had the faith with his eyes fixed on Jesus that he was willing, well, God, that he was willing to see the impossibilities are the possibilities when everyone else around him saw the impossibilities. We'll get there, guys. Sorry. So, friends, may we have the faith of David. May we keep our eyes fixed on God. May we see the possibilities when everyone around us sees the impossibilities. And may we just show up. No excuses. Just show up. Because we never know how the Spirit will move if we do. And if we fail to show up, there's one guarantee that we won't be there in that moment when the Spirit was ready to move in our lives. So friends, that is our invitation. Our invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation that we do indeed show up and we follow and we go where the Spirit sends us. And just as we sang beautifully a few moments ago, May we respond with, here I am, God. I'm done with excuses. I'm done with all of the reasons why I feel like I don't need to show up because I'm here. And I will follow your Spirit's lead in every moment of my life. May my eyes be fixed on you. I'm just going to show up. If you would please, my friends, join me and stand and singing, Go Forth for God, hymn number 670.
So my sisters and brothers in Christ, may that be exactly what we do. May we go forth into the world filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and ready to show up for the people that need us to show up for them at any given moment, setting aside all excuses that we might be able to come up with to simply show up. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.